Hello there, my fellow OG members of the Star League, and welcome to another video on Battletech lore. Beginning today, we are gonna get started, hopefully with some success, on a new subseries of Battletech lore, focusing on important slash famous characters. Now, I will be the first one to admit that I do not know a huge deal about famous Battletech personalities so I'm gonna be learning at the same time as you. Do keep in mind that these are gonna be relatively short overviews and not detailed descriptions of every event and campaign that they took part in. Last but not least, if you folks have any other suggestions on important characters to cover, do write them down in the comments below. Unfortunately, even though today's topic, Alexander Kerensky, is one of the most famous characters in Battle the Glore, there are not that many pictures of him, so I'm gonna have to compensate with something I consider appropriate. With all that out of the way, I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? With his full name, Alexander Sergeyevich Kerensky, was maybe the foremost general of the Star League, who would later liberate Terra from the rule of the usurper Stefan Amaris. He was also the one who would lead the vast majority of the survivors of the Star League Defense Force, or SLDF for short, on the famous exodus into the deep periphery. But all of that is only him in a nutshell, so let us begin at the beginning. Born in the year 2700, Alexander Kerensky studied at Farkad University, where his achievements eventually earned him a place in the Nagel Ring. This was the most prestigious military academy in the Lyran Commonwealth. Here he would graduate in the class of 2723. After that, he enlisted in the military of the Star League. His rapid progression through the ranks, coupled with his own personal charisma and integrity, would earn him the respect of his units and made him famous throughout the Star League. He would eventually ascend and become the highest military officer in the Star League Defense Force. Of this phase of his career, it is known that he gave the specifications of the new Atlas battle mech as well, about which he said, and I quote, a mech as powerful as possible, as impenetrable as possible, and as ugly and foreboding as conceivable, so that fear itself will be our ally. In 2751, the first Lord Simon Cameron died, and his eight-year-old son, Richard Cameron II, became the first Lord of the Star League. The five House Lords gathered on Terra and appointed General Alexander Kerensky as Commander-in-Chief of the SLDF, and also as Regent and Protector of the Star League for the remainder of Richard's childhood. But while Alexander Kerensky was away commanding SLDF armies deployed in the periphery, suppressing rebellions, revolts, and movements of secession, the Terran hegemony was usurped by Stefan Amaris of the Rimworld Republic. This guy had masterfully deceived and manipulated Richard Cameron II, and then carried out the infamous Amaris coup in 2766. Amaris would gain control of the throne and murdered Richard and all the remaining Camerons. Amaris also trying to gain the loyalty of Kerensky, but in 2767 the amaris kerensky civil war began either way. In response to the usurpation, the SLDF conquered and destroyed Amaris's native Rimworld Republic in 2769. After regrouping and consolidating all available units, Kerensky would launch Operation Chieftain, a campaign intended to reconquer the entire Terran hegemony. He divided his armies into three main battle groups, one to travel through each of the accommodating houses towards the hegemony. In the early stages of the campaign, the forces of Kerensky reclaimed some of the hegemony worlds, but did pay a very high price in lives, military equipment, and resources. As the forces of Amaris retreated, Kerensky's army advanced even more, finally capturing the worlds closest to Terra. On the 23rd of January, 2777, 
Operation Liberation, the final phase of the Operation Terran Hegemony began, with SLDF units advancing on Terra from eight different worlds. In September 2779, the SLDF finally recaptured humanity's home planet, after a gigantic battle with over 100 million dead. Back in the Imperial Guard, we call that Monday. After discovering the fate of Richard Cameron and his family, Kerensky ordered the execution of Stefan Amaris and his entire family as well. However, the hegemony was devastated and in ruins. And, even worse, there was no rightful successor for the position of First Lord. With increasing disappointment, he saw that the feuding House Lords were simply unable to choose a new leader, instead only bickering among themselves. One year later, on the 10th of October, 2780, the Council Lords gathered again and stripped Kerensky of the title of Protector. Ten months after that, the Lords were still bickering among each other, each one claiming the title and position for him or herself, with the Council finally being dissolved by the Lords themselves on the 12th of August, 2781. Kerensky refused the proposal by General Aaron de Chevalier to overthrow the House Lords. The reason for this refusal is unknown. In the second half of the year 2783, Kerensky attended the ceremony to commemorate the special completion of the Hilton Head HPG complex, meeting privately with Jerome Blake afterwards, and confiding to the Minister of Communication his intention to leave the inner sphere. Although angry and confused at this course of action, as a token of respect and friendship with the general, Blake agreed to keep it a secret. Blake would also request Kerensky to speak to any of his units who declined to join the Exodus, and ask them to support his own reconstruction efforts in the hegemony instead. On February 14, 2784, Kerensky summoned more than 200 commanders of the surviving SLDF formally outlining to them his own plan for Operation Exodus. While the audience predominantly agreed with his intention, and many of them vowed to follow him, a small group disapproved, refusing to abandon the hegemony and the inner sphere. Kerensky responded by instituting a poll in late February of every remaining member of the SLDF and giving them the option to join the Exodus or stay behind. By the middle of March, more than 80% agreed to Kerensky's proposal. Those that did not want to join him did have their own reasons, but the bulk began to coalesce around the 151st Royal Battle Mech Division and its outspoken commander, Lauren Hayes. Concerned at leaving Hayes and her sizable unit without direction, and recalling Jerome's Blake pleas for help, Kerensky made a deal with Hayes herself. She could remain, but she would have to obey Blake and the Ministry of Communication as the last vestige of the Star League. One of the last acts of the General in the Inner Sphere was the final disposition of the Usurper's body, following the suggestion of one of his own command staff and donating it to the University of Samarkand Medical School. A rather public and shameful end for the guy who broke the Star League. During Operation Exodus, six million men, women and children followed General Alexander Kerensky into the deep periphery and into an unknown future. It is not known if Alexander had any clear destination in the beginning, and after a year of travel, morale suffered greatly, and the crews of a small number of vessels rebelled even and announced their intention to turn back. With few alternatives, Kerensky ordered the mutineers executed, and issued General Order 66, nah, just kidding, it's 137, insisting on the need for discipline. After another year of traveling, with discontent on the rise again, the flotilla of the Star League came upon five marginally inhabitable worlds, which would later become called the Pentagon Worlds, and here they chose to settle. Upon arrival, Kerensky would transmit a message back to the Inner Sphere. The message was called The Voice of Kerensky, and I quote, To all the citizens of the Inner Sphere, do I, Alexander Kerensky, send greetings. 
know that I have taken the remnant of the Starlink Defense Force, which has remained true to its purpose beyond the boundaries of the Inner Sphere, and beyond the periphery. I have done this neither out of disappointment with those we leave behind, nor out of spite or disdain, as some will inevitably say. We have left the Inner Sphere because we love it too much to see it destroyed. In the wake of the usurper's coup and the long, bitter fighting that came with it, I fear that my forces would do incalculable, possibly irreparable harm to our society. We are sworn to defend the Starlig and its subjects, not destroy it. Thus, we left the only homes we have ever known to place the destructive capability of this armada beyond the reach of those who would use it not for defense, but for conquest. Perhaps, with the might of our mechs and ships out of reach, the leaders who are now grappling with one another will relinquish their dreams of subjugating their neighbors and learn to live in peace with them. Perhaps, one day, should humanity step back from the brink of the abyss, we, our children, or our children's children will return, to once again serve and protect and guide the Star League in mankind's quest for the stars. Farewell. After that, Kerensky and his followers did their best to recreate a new Star League as best as possible. However, within just one year, cracks began to show. The Pentagon worlds would enter into what would be later called the Exodus Civil War. Increasingly frail after the death of his wife Katyusha and his friend Aaron de Chevalier during what would become known as the De Chevalier Massacre, Kerensky gathered to him the few remaining loyal units. But in 2801, he would die at the age of exactly 100 years. And with his dying wish, he left the remnants of the exiled Star League in the hands of his son, Nicholas Kerensky. His death, though, was the final nail in the new Star League's coffin. His son was not accepted as the successor by the majority of the high-ranking officers. He was thus forced to launch a second exodus to Strana Mektai. And if I'm mispronouncing that, do correct me. In order to save at least something out of the imminent disaster. The body of the general was laid to rest by his son in a specially made glass coffin aboard the battleship McKenna's Pride, and put in a geosynchronous orbit above Katyusha City on Strana Mektai. The modern-day clans revere Alexander Kerensky as the Great Father, a messianic leader who led his chosen people to safety, while promising their return to the Inner Sphere and rebuild the Star Lake. The people of the Inner Sphere hold much more mixed views of the General, where previously he was seen as a protector of the Star League of old, and a man who chose the hard and honorable option of exile instead of becoming mired in the politics of the Great Houses. The actions of his descendants, however, have tainted his memory to the point that some view him now as even worse than Stefan Amaris. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about a famous general, and in some indirect ways, the founder of the clans, Alexander Kerensky. I hope you enjoyed this brief overview, and like I said in the beginning, if you know other famous characters with some lore behind them, do feel free to suggest them below. Are you a fan of Alexander Kerensky? Do you know other important facts about him that I didn't mention today? If so, do share your thoughts on him in the comments below as well. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please click the like, share, and subscribe buttons for future content. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and I wish you all a great and healthy day. This is GDN signing out.